Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. After that huge heavy episode on vegan watercolors over the weekend, today I wanted to just go ahead, take a step back and do something just for the fun of it. Now if you've been following me over on Instagram, you might have seen that I went ahead and put together finally my first ever 48 color palette set, which is actually 52 colors because I squeezed an extra pan into each row. These are all Daniel Smith and as you know Daniel Smith does not offer pans, so these have been tubes that I have uh, acquired over the years and some samples that my awesome viewers have sent me. None of this would have been possible without the help of some amazing people, so huge thanks to both Ophelia and Eve who have their own channels. I'll put the links in the description below. They were able to send me some samples to kind of round out my collection, and also to Victor and Tiffany. Uh, Victor sent one of the pans over in a My Merry Blue set. Uh, you might have remembered that from a long time ago. Uh, and then Tiffany also gave me a bunch of samples while I was visiting her uh, earlier last year. So I am really excited to finally have this whole set put together and I thought it might be fun to do a little swatching video. So it's been a long time since I've done one of these. I think the last one that I had was actually when the Schminka new colors came out and we just sat down with the swatch card that they provided with me to go over the new colors. But I thought it was time to do another one. So I have ended up not only with the 52 colors in this set, but also I have some on my main palette that the tubes were empty at the time that I filled up my main palette, so I don't have them uh, in a pan form, but I will be adding them to this chart. And then I also have a couple, uh, as I mentioned, I got some samples from Tiffany that had to go on a paper plate in order to travel home with me. So those are also separate as well. I try to get them mostly in order here, although I did forget about a bunch of colors at the end, so I've got some colors down here that aren't in color rainbow order, but for the rest of it, let's go ahead and get started. Now this is going to be a super chill and pretty long video, as I'm sure you can already tell, you're in the future, you can see however long this video is when I uploaded it. Um, I'm gonna try and edit it as little as possible, and we're just gonna relax have a conversation and go through some colors. I'm gonna try and make as little extraneous noise as possible, but there is gonna be a little bit of rattling both from the pans and then also from the swishing of the water in the cups, so I apologize in advance if that's something that bothers you. Hopefully it won't be too bad. Um, I do have the Daniel Smith dot cards, so I have seen, like visually seen, all of the Daniel Smith colors before, but I don't necessarily have enough of them to do any kind of paintings or tests or anything like that, so that's one of the reasons I was so excited to finally put together this giant accumulation of Daniel Smith colors. So this first one here is uh, Lemon Yellow, which is made from PY175. It's a really, really cool um, lemony yellow. It is not the same color that typically is used for lemon yellow, which is PY3. That one is next door with Hansa Yellow Light. I am using some new brushes that a viewer sent me very kindly. Uh, her name, I think, is Melody. She sent over some of the Colors of Nature vegan watercolor brushes, um, and I am trying them out. I put them a little bit in that vegan video, so far, they kind of have, I can't tell if it's the, if it's the paint brushes themselves or if it's something that's getting on them, but I, I'm having a lot of issues with like lint and hairs and I don't know if Cricut's just gotten in the way too many times or, or what's going on, but we'll see how it progresses throughout this video. Maybe we'll switch a little bit later. So you can see here that Hansa Yellow Light is a little bit warmer than the Lemon Yellow and it's also a little bit more opaque. It's funny because in their pans they actually look uh, swapped. This one looks warmer and this one looks cooler, but uh, when you paint them out they're a little bit different. I have a wide selection of yellows here on this palette that we've got put together and some new ones that I'm really exciting to be using for almost the first time. I've had them for a little while, but it's nice to officially get them acquainted with each other and with me. I particularly like this Hansi Yellow Medium. It's not a color that I ever had on my palettes before because 
when I first started off watercoloring, I had a cool yellow and a warm yellow and didn't have the in-between. But as I paint more and more, there seems to be less of a difference for me in the yellows that I use. So having a middle of the road one isn't all that bad and I, I like it for convenience. All right, I'm starting to get a little bit uh, anxious or frustrated isn't the right word, but annoyed maybe with these brushes. I really can't tell if it's the brush or my paint jar or what. So we're gonna finish up this row and if I still I'm not happy with it, we'll switch to a different brush. Daniel Smith's uh, Indian Yellow is not a single pigment. I know it is in some brands. Um, here it is literally a combination of the two yellows I have on either side of it. We've got the PY97 on the left, and then you'll see in a moment we'll have PY50 on the right. So this is a convenience color more than anything else if you didn't want to have the other two on your palette. The camera always has a hard time picking up subtle differences between any colors, but particularly I found on yellows and like purples it's, it's not great at. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to see the difference on these colors. I will also go ahead and take pictures of these charts um, as soon as I finish this, after they dry, and I'll go ahead and put them up on my Patreon, and I'll make them free, like public posts, so you can all view them. And uh, while you're over on Patreon, if you want to take a look around and see if anything catches your eye, that's fine too. But again, I'll put them up as a free resource on my Patreon page, so you can all get a better look at the colors a little bit more accurately. Photos are a little bit easier to do that than the actual moving video is. Now I went ahead and put the pigment numbers at the top there in that thicker uh, pen so that we could go ahead and have something to do an opacity test with. Um, I'm going to have to move this out of the way just a little bit so you can see that last column there. Um, I didn't want to go through and put little squares on everything and I just got lazy and didn't want to do a, a line with a ruler or anything so I figured we'll just put the pigment numbers up there. It'll be a little harder on our darker colors because it'll want to cover it up but we'll figure out ways around that. So here we're moving into officially our warm yellows. First with the new gamboge. This is a combination of PY97 and PY110, which I don't have in Daniel Smith, the PY110, but it is a warm yellow. My paper is curved ever so slightly over and a, and a little hunch, so my my concentrated color is trying to fall down the back side a little bit. I want to make sure you can see everything. See that color, initially at least, is fairly opaque, but we'll see when it dries. You can see some of the other colors, like once that PY3 dried a little bit, it's not as opaque as it looked when it was wet. All right, Hansa Yellow Deep is on my main palette, so let me reach around the side here. This is one, if you remember seeing my palette getting set up uh, when I got my new porcelain palette in the mail. The tube exploded everywhere and went all haywire. Still hanging in though. If you haven't heard me say it already, I've mentioned it in a couple of other videos, I fully, fully, fully regret filling the wells on this thing. They're giant and so any colors that I think that I want to change out or even just for ease of use when I'm going into the palette and want just the pure color instead of mixing it, I have to put it on the main well so that I can <laughs> dilute it down and not use it at full strength. And uh, I wish I had only filled them up halfway so that I could have half of the palette for mixing those pure colors. Learn from me, folks. Don't make the same mistakes I did. Whoops, sorry. I hit my little camera boom arm here. So Hansa Yellow Deep is the first uh, warm yellow that I got along with Hansa Yellow Light. Those were the two yellows I had on my palette. 
I still think I prefer PY65 compared to other warm yellows that I've tried, but I do find myself using it a little less often these days. I'm trying to incorporate more of like trying out the Nicolazzo yellow, and then I use a lot of earth tones, as you guys know, with quinacridone gold and, and um, yellow ochre. I know some people use yellow ochre as the warm yellow on my palette. I don't really see them the same way. You'll notice that the yellow ochre is not in this yellow section. I keep it in my earth tone section. So I would still prefer to have a, a range of clear yellows uh, and then move into the earth tones at another point in my color selection. This is transparent pyrrol orange and you can see we had a pretty big jump between the Hansa Yellow Deep and the transparent pyrrol orange. I don't really have a middle of the road orange on my palette because I don't find it necessary. It's a very easy color to mix, and so I would rather just have colors on either side. And Daniel Smith's Transparent Pyro Orange is so deep and vibrant, it's almost a red, and uh, it's really useful for mixing blacks. I have, another co co I have another color, don't know why that word didn't come out, on my main palette. This is Pyro Red. PR254, this is going to be an opaque color or at least a semi-opaque color. Gonna lose some of our font there. All right, so the brush has started to behave. Maybe it was a fluke. I hope it was a fluke. And Pyro Red's really your like fire engine -y red. Very, very deep. And uh, out of all the warm reds that I've ever tried, I keep going back to that particular color. I just find it the most useful in everyday painting. But we've got another one here. I've got Perlene Red. This is one that I believe Ophelia sent me. It's just a slightly bit cooler than the Pyro Red and more saturated. It's a really nice color, actually. I think it has a larger drying shift, so we'll see once it dries uh, how we still like it compared to the Pyro Red, but I have to admit I haven't used it in many paintings. And at this point, with all the paints that I've tried, a lot of times it just comes down to, like, I literally just have all of this pyro red in my main palette. Who knows when it'll get used up, so I'm not going to, like, take it out and waste it just to add a different color in, in its place. So there's a lot of that where I'll find a new color that I do like better in some cases and then not replace it right away just because I don't want to be wasteful. Next up we have Quinacridone Coral. This is PR209, and this is a color that I didn't have on any palette for a really long time, and then all of a sudden, I got a ton of them, um, mostly from people sending me things to review, so I tried like the Mission Gold and the Da Vinci, and they just started popping up everywhere, and then I was able to try uh, this color. I think this is one that Eve sent me. And this is one that I have a hard time placing on like a rainbow lineup because it is, I feel like it's warmer than some of these other colors. Like it feels a little bit more orangey to me, but it's such a light and different value that it also doesn't look right over here. So I never know where to put it, but for the sake of this palette, that's where it ended up. Now I do have Quinacridone Rose PV19, but I forgot it when I was writing out my chart. It was the only mistake that I made in my main palette anyway, so forgive me for that. We'll get to that when we come over here at the bottom of our second page. We're going to skip straight to Carmine, which if you remember my top five videos is my favorite red to use. It's a very cool red very pretty. It's not maybe as light fast as some of the other choices, but I completely love it. 
Yeah, this one's definitely out of order next to the Quinn Coral because it's not on. Let me show you my sheet here. These ones are all nicely arranged so that they go in the right places next to each other. But uh, I just kind of slapped Carmine in there between the reds and the, the purples. You can see how drastically cooler it is next to that quinacridone coral. I don't know if I finished my thought. That's why I edit my videos, folks. <laughs> I lose my train of thought really often, so I like to go back and check over. But since I'm not going to do that on this one, um, it's not as light fast as some of the other colors, but I just think it's absolutely gorgeous. I love using it. Now that the pyrrole red and the perylene red have dried, you can hopefully see that this one is a deeper value and it's slightly cooler than the pyrrole red. This is a warmer red, and uh, I would have to use the perylene red more in my paintings before I could give like an informed opinion on how I feel about it uh, in an actual painting. I moved my little color chart, so I need to make sure it's back, so I'm grabbing the right colors here. All right, we're skipping the Quinn Rose, skipping it to the Quinacridone Magenta. This is PR202. This is another one that Eve sent me. Very, very cool, almost purple, or violet, whichever one you want to call it. I think we talked about that in my is red a primary color video um, we talked about how different cultures have different words for violet and purple and that it's not universal and different people call it different things so even if you get it right like in the United States it might be different somewhere else so I'm not picky about it you can call it whatever you like all right, Ultramarine is on my main palette. I don't have it in the pan set, but this is such a pretty purple, you guys. I absolutely love it. I love warm purples, and I thought about it for a long time before I, sorry, bumped the cord. <laughs> I thought about it for a really long time before I bought it because I wasn't sure how often I'd use it. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna do it. I love this color, it's so beautiful. We're just going to go for it, and I never use it. It's so beautiful on its own, but it doesn't have a lot of uses in animal paintings, and so I just don't find myself ever reaching for it. But I would have a wall in my house this color. It makes me that happy to look at. It's so beautiful. I rented a room for a little while after college, and the owner of the house, for whatever reason, let me paint that room, and one of the walls was actually very close to that color. It was my accent wall, and I loved it. Next up, I've got Naphthamide Maroon. It's also on my main palette. I think it's also in my... My pan set, come to think of it. I'm looking over there, and it does appear to be there as well. This is one that Tiffany got me for my birthday, a sweetheart. I went to go visit her while I was down there for BlizzCon. If you haven't checked out my blog from, or my vlog, vlog, from back then, I documented the whole trip, and it was so much fun. And, um... I was just excited to get to meet her and have her take me to her art store to show me around, which it was an incredible art store. But on top of that, and on top of sharing her paints with me uh, to take home samples, she also got me my very own tube of naphthamide maroon. And let's see, Perlene Violet, another Eve color. PV29. The first time I used this was a Schmincke color. It was one that they sent me um, along with my dot card for the new colors. So I got to try that out. That got added to my palette. And I use it quite often. It's 
kind of a reddish deep violet. Oh guys, my shoulder is already getting tired. How did that happen? We're not even a quarter of the way through. All right, breathe, slow down, rest shoulder. I think it'll be better when we get to the second half of the paper. I'm having to hold the paper at a weird angle right now to make sure it's on the desk. So once we get up a little higher, it should be better. All right, you can see there's a big jump between the perylene violet and the carbazole violet. This is a dioxazine violet um, that you might be familiar with in other brands. It's PV23. In my opinion, it is the most useful uh, pigment for violet. Again, if you haven't seen those top five color episodes, I highly recommend them. They were so much fun to put together and I talk all about my different favorite colors across different brands. I'm trying to like clear a little bit of a, a pathway so we can see that number. It's all right, I'll remember. Oh my goodness, you guys, I just almost had a heart attack. I looked up and my little red recording light is hovering over the fire engine red and it blended in and for a second I thought I didn't record any of this. That would have been tragic. All right, so the shadow violet I ended up putting in the purples when I was arranging my colors because it's called shadow violet, but in my swatch book, this actually sits with the grays. It's a very, very, very gray color and I don't know. I mean, I guess it's a shadow color, but it just feels really gray to me. I have yet to use it in a painting, so maybe I'll change my mind, but right now I don't have any, like, inspiration for using this in a painting. Daniel Smith has a couple of these really unique granulating colors that people are really excited about. My chart just fell <laughs> uh, across the other side of the room. Want to see it? This is the uh, chart for all the colors on my main studio palette. It just fell off the wall, so we'll just tuck that over to the side. All right, here's the color I do like, and I haven't used it in a painting yet because, again, I don't know where to put these purple colors sometimes, but it is one of the Primatech colors. This is Amethyst, and the square is my little personal symbol for a genuine Primatech color since it doesn't have a pigment name, and we still want to do a light fastness test with it. So amethyst is literally ground up amethyst stone, so it has a beautiful sparkle to it when it dries. I did pre-wet all of these pans that are in the pan set um, to try and make sure that they were ready for us. I would recommend that with most of the Primatech colors. You want to give them a little bit of a head start. So this is going to look like most other purples until it dries a little bit and then I'll try and show you the the texture on it. Sorry guys, I'm trying to get my shoulder to relax. Ooh, we're gonna move on to French Ultramarine. I wonder if there's any way I could sit that would help this out. I don't know that there is. Maybe if I tilt this a little bit, tilt that a little bit. Sorry for the redecorating folks. That might be more helpful. We will see. All right, French Ultramarine. Now, Daniel Smith's Ultramarine is the one that I had on my palette for up until, I don't know, a couple of months ago, and I do love the color and I love the texture of it, but it is really hard to re-wet, and it does often have a, like, a rock-hard texture if you've left it out for too long. It might be better if you live in a more humid environment, but at least here in San Jose, we're near desert conditions, and uh, 
I have a harder time using it. So I switched over to Sennelier, which stays nice and moist on the palette. So let me know what your favorite version of Ultramarine is. I'd be curious to know. There's so many, and they're all pretty similar in hue, but they handle differently and have different granulation patterns. All right, this is Thalo Blue Red Shade, and I know that everyone was like losing their marbles over Schmincke's version when they released it, and it's a beautiful color. I love this color so much. I don't know how much more useful it would be in paintings because I know a lot of people, like even Jane Blundell, who used to recommend this color, now recommends the green shade uh, in terms of your mixing palette because it's just more versatile. But... Getting back to the, the Schmincke thing, I don't know why like no one ever paid attention to Daniel Smith's version because it's absolutely gorgeous as well. And they've had it for as long as I know. Um, it's been on their dot chart for a long time and been available for a long time and I don't ever hear anyone talking about it. The paper I'm using today, by the way, is Canson XL. So it is a cheaper watercolor paper. These colors would look a little bit different on a on arches especially our granulating colors would look different on arches but I did not have the stamina today to try and put up with doing all of the um, the notes on here like the names of the colors and the pigment numbers on a textured paper today it really eats at the nib and took a long time so for me, this is good enough, I think, um, just to have them all in kind of one place, and hopefully you like it as well. Here is the green shade of Thalo Blue, so you can see that there is a fairly large difference in the two colors. When you've got Ultramarine and the Thalo Blue green, uh, red shade next to each other, they don't look that similar, but when you add in the Thalo Blue, you can see that the hues start to look more similar. Warm and coolness of colors is all relative. I mean, there's going to be certain colors that always look one way or the other just because they lean so heavily in one direction or the other, but for the vast majority, the temperature can change based on what colors are around it. And that's what's so important to keep in mind when you're working on your paintings, is that if you have, if you've only been working on one area and don't have the rest of the colors blocked out, you might overcompensate or undercompensate um, that area based on what it looks like next to the white paper that you haven't painted yet. And that can change a lot when you start adding your other colors. So just something to be aware of. Everyone has a different style. Some people like working one area at a time. Some people like putting in a base layer of all their values so that you know kind of where you're going and where you're coming from. I like to do a little bit of both depending on the subject. This color here is Thalo Turquoise. It's Thalo Blue Green Shade mixed with PG36, and I absolutely love it. It's a beautiful color. We've been working off of my palette for a little bit. These two are both on my main palette. We're gonna hop back over to my my pan set, and the next color is Mind Blue Genuine. This is an Ophelia color, thank you. Ophelia has a new channel, I think I mentioned that before, but uh, if you haven't checked it out already, it'll be in the description below for you. She's working on some fun stuff over there. Now, I like Mayan Blue Genuine fine, but I like Mayan Dark Blue a lot better. We're going to get to that in a moment. And if you remember my top five favorite blues episode, I actually nudged out Prussian Blue for this Mayan Dark Blue. And um, I have a little bit of regret of, of that now. The blues are my first episode and I kind of changed as I went through them. And um, there were other colors that I made exceptions for and I wish I had done that with uh, the Mayan Dark Blue. I wish I had let them share a spot or something like that. I'm gonna adjust real quick the exposure. I'm worried that it's gotten a little dark on you. So hopefully that is better. 
So yeah, I only have a little bit of this left, but it's so beautiful. Such a deep, moody blue. I did see one of my viewers pointed out that they checked the light fastness on it and it has a light fast rating of two instead of one, which I was a little surprised at because a lot of blues are just light fast by nature. So I just never, I guess, looked at it or gave it any thought because I just assumed. But that's what you get when you assume. <laughs> Okay, you can see over here the Mayan Blue Genuine is kind of streaky and has kind of a gelatin-like um, texture to it that I don't love. And the Mayan Dark Blue is a little bit more loose and free. It has more value so you get more range out of the color. Alright, I think the next couple are ones that Eve has donated to my cause. So we've got Endin Thrain, Endin Throne, Endin Throne. Daniel Smith calls her Endin Throne. And you guys already know my favorite version of PB60 is M. Graham, but I will allow for others to have room in my heart as well. I had never used Daniel Smith's before Eve sent it, so. The biggest issue in general with PB60 is that it can have a really severe drying shift. So we'll see when this one dries what we're left with. Indigo is one that I did have in my collection. Um, I bought it, you know, I think it was on sale or something. Like it was one of the extra tubes that they had. Because I don't know why I would have bought it otherwise. I had already had Neutral Tint, which we'll see later on, and I do like that color a lot, and I use it a lot, and so if I already had that, I don't know why I would have picked up Indigo. Maybe someone recommended it to me, maybe I had a temporary lapse in judgment. I do know, though, that I have a, a fairly full tube of it here. If I recall correctly, Daniel Smith's version, at least, is going to dry very, very gray. It's going to lose a lot of that blue saturation. Made that a little wider than I meant to. I was just trying to clean up the edge there. It's definitely stepping on Indian Thrones toes. All right, then we've got the pair of Payne's Grays. So the second one will be their original formula that they've had for a long time. This first one is one of their newer colors that they released at the beginning of 2017. In my opinion, these three colors all look real similar to each other. I don't, I don't have any strong feelings, I guess, about Payne's Gray or about dark grays. So I might not be the best person to talk on this because, you know, I'm like, oh, look at these tiny little differences and all these browns that no one else cares about. And to me, that's important. And to other people, it's not. And maybe these hold kind of the same thing for other people where it doesn't matter to me at all. But maybe you guys like having those options for different grays. Payne's Gray is definitely more on the gray side. It also uses ultramarine, so it granulates a bit. It does have PBK9 in it, which is bone black, which just coming off of our vegan watercolor video. Bone black is made from animal bones, so just be aware of that if you want to avoid that pigment. I think it's the only one that we've encountered so far. We might have some later on, I can't remember. Now a color I do love and have plenty of uses for is our next one. We've got Perlene Green here.
It's a great color for mixing shadows. I love it when you mix it with carmine. It makes it a really deep purple. The more I look at my viewfinder on my camera, the more I'm worried that y'all are going to not have a properly exposed image. Hold on one second. I don't know if that's better, but uh, I'm trying, guys. I really need to upgrade my lighting situation. I've got lights waiting in my Amazon cart for my next Amazon Associates payment to come through, although that probably won't happen for another couple weeks. I used my last one on um, a bunch of convention display things that I needed in a pinch. But the next one that's coming through, I believe, is from December, which is when everyone was holiday shopping, so it's a little bit bigger than usual. So I'm going to treat myself to some lights that I desperately need to do better recordings for all of you guys. All right, so here we've got Deep Sap Green. This is one that you've sent over, and this is not one that I have used before, um, before she had sent it. I really like it. It's a deep, nice, foresty green, but it is three colors. Then we've got our and then we've got our Thalo Green Blue Shade. Everyone knows this guy. My roommate is out going through the house, so I hope it's not too disruptive. The problem is, is if I close my door cricket like will automatically get up from wherever she is sleeping being perfectly fine and try and scratch on the door to get in or if she's in the room already she'll try and scratch to get out even though nothing has changed other than the door is closed but you know cats We've talked about Thala Green a lot on this channel before. Um, if you haven't already seen the color Spotlight on it, I highly recommend it. Um, it's a color that I had taken off of my palette. I, I got it when I first started watercoloring and putting together my first palette. I took it off because it was really, really unnatural and I couldn't figure out how to use it in any of my paintings. And then later I realized um, through watching videos and doing research how crucial it is and how valuable it is as a color. So I added it back to my palette and it has been in the mix ever since. So you can see here that the ultramarine turquoise is a lot more on the green side. Whereas up here we've got the thalo turquoise and that's a little bit more on the blue side. Although these could have gone next to each other just fine as well could have put that guy down here but again that one was on my main palette it's not mixed in with the other ones and I was just kind of guessing at where it would go the ultramarine one will of course granulate as well since it's got ultramarine in it we've got amazonite genuine next and I think that I have a tiny bit of glycerin mixed into this one. I could be wrong, but it's a pretty difficult color to re-wet, so I think when I was pouring the pan I put some in. But maybe not. I do know that it had separated a lot from its binder and I had to do a lot of stirring. So we might get some streaking here. It's kind of a property of paints when the binder separates, at least in my experience, when the binder separates from the paint and you mix it back together, there might be more binder than usual that has separated at the top and then you mix it into a smaller amount of pigment, if that makes any sense. And so you get kind of the streaky appearance. I bought the Amazonite because it was on the swatch card and I really liked the color that it was, but honestly, it's very similar to the Thalo Green. Actually, I would probably compare this more to Viridian. Uh, it granulates less than Viridian, but it's very much in that same lightly toned, but still greenish blue color family. 
The next color I have from them is Cobalt Teal, and this one is in a stick form. So I've cut off a little chunk and it's in a pan, but I find this color really, really, really hard to re-wet. And it also has this thing, I'd love for you guys to tell me if um, you have experience with Daniel Smith's Cobalt Teal either in stick or tube form. This color, when I spray it down with my water bottle before I get ready to use it, the puddle that sits on top of the stick will turn like a yellowish color. Like it's like part of the pigments are separating out of them and they're yellow or pigments are reacting with the water and it's turning yellow. And I'm not sure if that's specific to the stick or if it is just part of this color. Um, I personally would not recommend the stick. I don't care for it at all. You already know that I love M. Graham's Cobalt Teal, so that's the one I keep on my palette, and it's very pliable, very easy to use. This one takes a lot more work to get it on your paper. Next we've got Fuchsite Green Genuine. This is another Primatech color and another sparkly one when it dries. It's going to finish up our page here. It's a nice, like a seafoam green. It's a really gorgeous color. I really want to do some like um, mythological seahorses and hippocampus or something with this. You've seen me paint hippocampus here on the channel before, right? There was one in my ultramarine color spotlight. I have a larger painting in my Etsy shop of one but this color would be perfect for it. I didn't have it back then, but it's another Eve color that she sent me to try out. It's one that I had been looking at on the dot card and wanting to try and get into my collection. So these aren't fully dry yet, but we'll just kind of go back through everything real quick. Set this off to the side. We'll get started on our second page. I think we're already like 40 minutes into this video. <laughs> And uh, hopefully it won't be another 40 minutes. I don't want you guys to have to sit through that much stuff, but hopefully you guys enjoy it. Cobalt teal, cobalt teal, where is cobalt teal? Sorry, cobalt turquoise, not cobalt teal. I have my granulating palette, which I also had a video on um, in the past. So the original palette were these eight colors here. Um, I added Amazonite when I got it, and then a couple of the colors that I got from Tiffany that were on that plate that I showed you earlier. Um, I took my favorite ones off and slapped them in here. And so, oh, you guys, there's another color I forgot. I have Serpentine Genuine, and that's not anywhere on here, and I have exactly one fewer spaces than I need. Maybe I'll do it on a little piece of paper for you so you can still see it. But, let me make sure I'm grabbing the right one. This is Cobalt Turquoise. It's a really pretty color. It granulates really, really heavily. Oops, here we go. Again, if you saw my vegan video just the other day. Um, cobalt colors were something I avoided really heavily on my palette when I first started painting because I didn't want any toxic colors and while that's still true I have gotten a lot of supplies from other people obviously to review here on the channel and so I've ended up with them whether or not I wanted them and I have always admired the cobalt colors so um, I've kind of loosened up my reins on that a little bit. I still don't have any cadmium colors, which I'm very happy about, but uh, these colors are just so pretty not to try. <laughs> I was weak. My moment of weakness. Pretty sure this neighbor is Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. This is probably the color that I was kind of lusting after the most on the Daniel Smith dot chart. It's also one of their most expensive pigments. It is incredibly expensive. And I was actually happy that when I got the actual spot, like it's gorgeous, but it's not one of those, like I have to have it or I'm gonna die colors, you know? So I was happy that that was the case so that I don't have to spend all my money. I think 
I could be totally wrong on this. I think that this comes from a mine in the southwest of the United States. It's from a specific patch of turquoise. Sorry, I got a little crooked there. Jadeite green is this one here. This is a very green color. It's gonna be out of place here. I don't know why I wrote it here. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> gonna ruin the very harmonious thing we've got going on. I should have swapped these two for sure. If you haven't seen Cascade Green yet, you'll see why in a moment. Cascade, or sorry, Jadeite Green is a genuine color and it separates out from like this uh, bluish green and then it has like a dark brownish green pig, uh, pigment that falls and settles out of it. Cascade Green is not a genuine pigment. It is made from PBR7, I believe the raw sienna version and Thalo Blue PB15. And when you first put it on your page, it's gonna look like this one solid color. But as you add more water and let it dry, it is going to separate out into two different colors. You're gonna have a slightly yellowish raw sienna color kind of fade out amongst the blue. All right, I think we can put this guy down for a little bit. We'll come back to him later. Undersea green is next, and I'm not really sure why they call this color undersea green. I feel like the cascade green looks way more sea-like to me, but I guess this is kind of like a kelpie color. Wait a second. Oh no, you guys. I was like, this doesn't look right. I had Cascade Green poured out into a pan. Let's see what I can do. Let me try and lift this up. I was like, that looks real, real similar to his neighbor. You're probably sitting there at home and you're like, what do you mean that doesn't look like an undersea green? That looks totally like it belongs under the ocean. Skip one over, let's try again. That's why you look at your labels. All right, undersea green, kind of kelpie. Very, very green. Definitely should have switched these two. It'll only bother me, I'm sure, and anyone else that has OCD. I hate when colors are not organized perfectly. I actually redid this chart twice because I had put like one or two colors in the wrong spot and needed to rearrange them. And therefore I had to redo the entire sheet because that's just how I am. All right, so here hopefully you can see what I'm talking about. It doesn't feel very undersea to me. Maybe it's just not my sea, maybe it's someone else's sea. I'm trying to cover up that blue the best that I can. But I think that's a pretty accurate representation of this color, especially down here in the bottom half. All right, Green Appetite is on my main palette. This is another Primatech color, similar to the Jadeite Green. We're going to get a granulation that separ separates out of it, but this is going to be much more mossy sap green type of color. And the granulation that comes out of it is straight up like a brown. I forget which channel it is. There's a really cool channel smaller I believe that she tried to recreate a lot of these interesting granulating colors. If I can I'll try and find it again. If not maybe one of you can comment below if you've also seen that and want to share it. 
All right, first up, I've got the original Sap Green, which if I have to tell you how much I love this color, obviously you haven't been watching the channel enough. <laughs> this is my favorite green, guys. My favorite convenience green. I think phthalo green is more convenient for mixing, but uh, this one has phthalo green in it and is just a beautiful color. It's made with the original quinacridone gold, which is why it's no longer available. And next door, we've got the new sap green made with the dupe for the quinacridone gold, which is made from PY150 and PO48. And then also mixed with the phthalo green. Okay, you guys, it's really similar. I know I'm picky. You probably guys are like, Denise, what's your problem? Just admit that you like the new one. It's fine. It is fine. It's good. Okay, I said it. It's good. To be fair, though, I hadn't used this color until very, very recently. I had only had the original tube, and so I was trying all these different brands, and I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to find this perfect combination. And really what I should have done is just been like, hey, Daniel Smith, what you got? Because... It's not the same. This one definitely has more yellow undertones, but it's as close as you're going to find on the market, I feel like. All right, the next color is green gold, and this is one that I got when I heard people talking, oh, green gold is this really great color, and I didn't realize, I don't know how I didn't realize because it's a triple pigment color, but I didn't realize that this was not what people were talking about. <laughs> Rich green gold is the one that other brands call green gold, and we'll see that in just a moment. So this is just basically a yellow green, and I have it on both of my like starter palettes that I started with, and I didn't find myself using it very often. I would just, when I wanted a color like this, I would just take like the sap green and then add some yellow into it. Um, so I, as an animal painter, I don't use this very often, but I'm sure as a landscape artist, I'd have plenty of uses for that in like highlights and foliage and everything. It's a really pretty color. Rich Green Gold is PY129, and this is what people are talking about when they actually mean green gold. And you can kind of see why it looks like a gold that is dirty with some green. I believe that M. Graham calls their version Azo Green. Don't quote me on that, though. I feel like I can fairly confidently say that. I just don't want to be wrong. <laughs> and then we're going to transition over to um, our buff titanium. Before I do that, though, I want to show you this green Appetite Genuine. If you haven't seen this color before, it's got like this bright, almost neon green that looks completely unnatural, but somehow is, that settles out of the pigment, and then you've got that brown granulation on top of it. It's really interesting. All right, moving on, Buff Titanium. This is a color that I got because the fabulous Jane Blundell recommended it, and I was like, well, you know, I've been painting for a while now, and if she says it's good, it must be good. I know a lot of urban sketchers in like Europe use this color, and it's probably really, really, really helpful for all of those old buildings, but California doesn't have many of those. So I have to say it's not super useful for me. We do have beaches, and I feel like this would be useful if I painted a lot of beaches. Uh, it's a great sand color. And actually, Jacqueline just gifted me Jane Blundell's mixing book, which is super awesome. I haven't gotten a chance to go over it super in-depth, but she has a whole section, because this is on her mixing palette, of this mixed with her colors. And when you mix it with phthalo green, uh, at least according to her swatches, it makes like a cobalt teal color, which if that is true, I am super excited because then I would have a cobalt teal color that is non-toxic. And how great would that be? You could not have those cobalt colors at all. I tried for so long to stay away from cobalt teal and I just couldn't because it's such a unique color. Super, super helpful for making lichen, seafoam greens, things like that. Here's uh, their Naples yellow. Uh, I'm not a big 
Like, I don't know a lot about Naples yellow. Um, this is a combination of three different colors. I think, could be wrong guys. I think that Naples yellow is PBR24, is that right? I have a Schmincke's version. It's called gold, um, titanium gold ochre, I think. And this is the color. So the mask tone looks fairly similar. This one is less chalky though. It's still gonna be more opaque than a lot of other colors, but uh, Daniel Smith's, you can tell that there's a white in there for sure. One of my favorites, and I know not everyone shares my sentiments with, is Yellow Ochre. Now I honestly cannot remember if this is the PY43 or the PY42 version. When I first started painting, they were using PY42 and then somewhere along the way they switched over and I don't remember what tube this is from. I think it is from my newer tube, which would be PY7, or PY43. Don't know where that seven came in, maybe over here. <laughs> um, I have a color spotlight on Sade's channel over at Sadie Saves the day when we did our video swap collaboration. So if you haven't seen that, head on over. I talk all about it and how it's different from a lot of other yellow ochres. It's not as chalky or opaque and I actually put together a palette recently of a lot of my other favorite colors from the color mixing series and I did not put yellow ochre on there. Not color mixing series guys, sorry, the top five favorite series. I was taking my favorites and putting them into one palette and trying to use some of these colors that I don't necessarily use with each other as often and I took it when me, with me when I went to LA this last weekend for my convention and I missed yellow ochre so much. Like I feel like everything I was sketching I needed yellow ochre for and I had quinacridone gold and I had a yellow, um, PY154 is my favorite yellow. Daniel Smith doesn't actually carry it though. Um, so I was like without this yellow ochre and I didn't know what to do and I was trying to mix it from my quinacridone gold and a brown and diluting it and it just looked flat and boring so I don't think I could live my life without yellow ochre. It's gonna have to get its way on that palette. I don't know who I'm gonna have to sacrifice to do it, but it'll happen. So I'm also really excited that Eve sent me the Mont Amiata Natural Sienna to try out because I know a lot of people talk about it and talk about how great it is. I, it's fine. I, it's more yellow than yellow ochre is. The yellow ochre is definitely a warmer version. Um, it is made from PBR7 rather than one of the uh, ochre colors. Just depends on what direction you want to lean. And I've heard that Daniel Smith's raw sienna is very different from other raw siennas. This is the only one that I've really used extensively. I have used a couple others in small quantities, but not in a large amount. So you can see that this one is a lot more brown. So I don't feel like these two colors are comparable, but then a lot of other brands, yellow ochres are more yellow and more opaque. And then the raw sienna is more yellow and lighter, kind of like this one, I think. I think this is typically what raw siennas look like. I don't know. Um, so when people are like, oh, you can replace yellow ochre with raw sienna. I was like, no, you can't. It's not the same color. That's where my confusion came from. Long story short. Long story, probably not so short. Been rambling for a while, guys. Let me know how you guys like this style of video. It makes me nervous because <laughs> I like being in control and editing things, but I know some of you have mentioned before that you really like more candid videos. This is Aussie Red Gold. It's one of their new 2017 colors and one that a lot of people were very excited about. It's really, really, really orange. Like, if you took gold and orange and put them together, that's what this color is. Super, super bright. I haven't used it in a painting yet. It's very pretty. I just don't know what I would use it for. Here's our gorgeous, unmistakable, irreplaceable, original quinacridone gold. And you guys, I cannot find... I had the stick, the Daniel Smith stick of the new formula of quinacridone gold. 
Don't know where it is. I think I gave it to someone. But I don't remember who. And I thought I kept a trunk, but I guess I did not. <laughs> um, no idea where it is, or I would put it on this chart so I can compare it next to each other. Someone asked me just the other day. No, it wasn't me. It was on another video. Um, but they asked how this one compares to the new one, and uh, I don't have it. It is made from PO48 and PY150. Uh, this is quinacridone gold deep. This is going to have more of the orange in it than the yellow, and then the quinacridone gold uh, new formula has more of the yellow, so it's more of that lighter color. You're going to see in a moment, this one is very close to quinacridone burnt orange. It just must have the tiniest hint of yellow into it. PY150 is a staining color, so these colors that have PY150 in them are going to stain. Less so on wood pulp papers than on cotton papers, I feel like is often the case. You guys see that? Sorry. So these two are actually fairly similar, but I feel like the quinacridone gold deep is more transparent. It just has a luminosity to it, but I'm also biased. I really like quinacridone burnt orange. I don't feel like I need to add Aussie red gold to my palette right away. I feel like it's fine to have quinacridone burnt orange and then just mix quinacridone gold into it or mixed nickel azo yellow into it to get the color that I'm looking for. All right, so now that I put this down and refresh my memory, this is definitely a deeper, <laughs> deeper version than the one I just painted, but you can definitely see the influence. This is an incredibly, incredibly uh, transparent color. And it is similar in hue to a lot of those brands of burnt sienna that use PR 101 that I always say that I don't like. It's not that I don't like that hue, it's that I don't like that they're calling it burnt sienna because it's not. <laughs> Then we've got quinacridone burnt scarlet. Now this one and then the garnet genuine that'll be right next to it, I feel like are really similar colors and I'd have to use them in paintings or in mixes to figure out what the actual difference is. I don't know off the top of my head what series number each of these are, so I don't know which one's more expensive, but in their just plain old swatches that I've done of them. I really feel like they're completely interchangeable, but if you have experience with these colors and want to throw in your two cents in the comments, let me know. You sent these really not that long ago and um, I haven't had a chance to properly play with them yet. She did warn me um, it doesn't smell on my end, but she warned me that her tube of garnet smells really awful. So if you don't have that tube and are considering it, make sure you know that ahead of time, if that is something that bothers you. I guess the quinacridone, or sorry, I guess the garnet genuine is a little bit more on the brown side. It's more brown, but I don't feel like it's a big enough difference. If there's a big price difference, like I would just go with the cheaper one. Next one is environmentally friendly red iron oxide, which is a mouthful, but it's a very pretty color. It's a burnt sienna tone that granulates more heavily and is a slightly bit more opaque. It's made from PBR6 instead of PBR7. I thought about replacing my burnt sienna with this color though, or at least my Daniel Smith version of burnt sienna. It's a little bit more on the pink side than your other brands are going to be. We talked about that in the top five browns episode. Put a little bit more up here so we can see that when it dries. Right next door we'll put the actual burnt sienna. 
And this is going to be a very brownish, a very pinkish brown version of Burnt Sienna. It's a little bit uh, semi-opaque. It granulates pretty heavily, especially on arches, maybe less so on student paper, but definitely on the arches it granulates pretty heavily. You can see what a huge dip or huge change there is between the quinacridone burnt orange and the burnt sienna. And the quinacridone burnt oranges, the burnt siennas that are more like the quinacridone burnt oranges, uh, you can see why if Daniel Smith was my first ever experience with burnt sienna, why I would be like, what do you mean that's burnt sienna? What are you talking about? All right, the next one is Permanent Brown. This is one of my favorite colors. It's a newer favorite for me, but it's a gorgeous red brown. In fact, that's what it is called in the Mission Gold line is red brown. And that's where I was first introduced to it. When I decided to do my year of no spending uh, in 2018, I bought a couple tubes of paint before the end of last year so that I could get those out of the way. Most of them were colors that I needed like Burnt Umber or Ultramarine so that I'd have those moving forward into the this year. But uh, this one I let myself indulge because I've been wanting it for over two years and uh, finally decided to add it. I don't regret this one. I know I said I regretted like the the Rose of Ultramarine after I had waited for so long and then I don't ever use it. This one I find very useful. It's really gorgeous. We're almost there guys. Almost there. It's definitely taken just as long to do this page as the, did the last page. If you're still with me, kudos. Thank you. No idea how long this video is going to take to export and upload. It's going to be a doozy that's okay. I'm planning on taking the rest of the day off finally. I had two like 12 to 14 hour days in a row where I was working on that vegan watercolor video. I literally only took a lunch break uh, the day before it released to go have lunch with my mom, but I worked through dinner. I worked through breakfast. I just, it was a very intense video. I promised myself in February that I'm going to do a better job at managing my time and also picking videos that are helpful, but also not as hard on me. So we can get a little bit more content out. Uh, more on that in a second, but this is Transparent Brown Oxide. I got it at the same time that I got the environmentally friendly Red Iron Oxide. And this is the most heavily granulating color I've ever seen, ever, anywhere. And uh, on Arches paper, it's really insane the amount of granulation you get. If you want to check out my granulation video, um, I use it in that painting. Um, so in February, guys, I guess this is a good time to announce it, although it's in the middle of the video, so I'm not sure how many of you are still with me. But uh, in February, I'm going to bump up my... My quota. I'm going to bump up the number of videos that I put out. I'm going to try and aim for three a week. I have a huge stack of paints to swatch out and review and I want to get some more tutorials out because I know I don't get out enough tutorials on the channel. So I'm going to try and do my best to to get more content out to you guys. I don't have any shows this month so I thought it would be a good opportunity to try and increase my video output. If there's anything that you've heard me talk about before that you really want to see, now is a good time to let me know. Let me know in the comments and I'll take that into consideration when I'm prioritizing videos. I'm going to let my patrons decide on a couple of them. <sighs> my very next video though, did you guys see the announcement at the end of the vegan video? The very next video that is going to be out on this channel is going to be the first artist animal, nope, animal artist collective. And um, it is a group that I am founding with Jennifer Charlie. And we are 
Uh, we've become really good friends over the past year. We met at a convention last March, so it's been almost a year. And we were chatting after one of my shows earlier this month. One of our shows earlier this month. We were both there. And um, we decided that we wanted to put together a group of artists that shared a common love for animals and wanted to do more in terms of fundraising and donations. So if you remember um, the endangered species videos that I used to do, I stopped making those because of the amount of intensity that it took and they were, you know, it was a series so it was every, it was supposed to be every week and it was just burnt me out really fast. These videos are not going to be with that frequency, but I'll still get to do the same types of things. I'll get to tell you about animals and we'll get to raise money for charities. So I'm so, so excited for that. That is going to be on Thursday the 8th. If you're watching this in the future and that video's already come out, make sure you go over and watch it too. All right, I kind of kind of went off on a tangent these last couple colors. This is Burnt Umber. Uh, I really like Daniel Smith's version, but again, I'm probably biased because it's the first one I ever used. We've got Raw Umber Violet, which is Raw Umber mixed with a PV-19, which is going to be one of your purplier shades of PV-19 Red Violet. I actually don't like this color as much as I like mixing it on my own palette. So I have a Raw Umber from Core. And I've got a Red Violet from Rembrandt, and I mix those together, and I really, really like the vibrancy from those colors. So I was really excited to try these from Eve. I'm still very grateful that she sent me some to try out, but I do like just mixing it on your palette better. I don't, need, I don't think you need to spend money on a whole separate tube of it. This is Neutral Tint. It's what I use in place of a black. This does have PBK9 in it, which I didn't know when I bought it. Now that I have it, it doesn't make sense for me to throw it out or anything. It'd still be wasteful. So uh, I'm almost out and I won't repurchase it. I'll find another alternative, but uh, I do like it. It's very convenient, very helpful for mixing quick blacks. I use it for small eye details or things like that where it doesn't matter if there's a lot of texture or color or granulation in it. I would want to mix my own black if I had like a large space that is going to have a lot of variation in it, like a shadow of a house or something like that, or along those same lines. But when I just have little areas, I like using this one. Much more efficient. All right, that does it for my little pan set here, we have a couple more colors that are from various random sources. This one is Lunar Blue. It's a heavily granulating blue that has a black granulation pattern that separates out of it. It is not a genuine Primatech color, and that's I feel like that's one of the only things that, um, for me at least, maybe it's just totally my own biases, uh, some of the Primatech colors have names that sound like totally ordinary colors and then vice versa. They have some of their specialty colors like Lunar Blue and Moon Glow and things like that that I feel like should be a Primatech color. I, I know there's nothing called Moon Glow so it doesn't make total sense but just in my head it feels like oh it's a Primatech color. It granulates so much. It's a specialty color that no one else has. It must be a Primatech. Does anyone else get that? I don't know. It's not a Primatech. It's just a PB15, which is Thalo Blue, and PBK11, which I think is Mars Black? I think I actually looked that up this morning, but I honestly, I don't know the black pigments very well off the top of my head. I know that Lamp Black is PBK6. I know that Bone Black or Ivy Black is PBK9. That's all I got off the top of my head. Alright. Oh, here's something interesting. This is Cascade Green, and you can see the phthalo blue has completely like settled out. So it is a color you'll want to mix up if you let it sit for a while. We have to go over to this super fancy schmancy plate here and uh, pull a couple colors off of it. We've got Blue Appetite Genuine in the middle here. This is a Primatech.
Jennifer has told me before that she has a friend that works for Daniel Smith, and I don't know this friend, but uh, I'm a little jealous. It's like knowing a celebrity. I know that's a little bit of an overstatement, but I just think it would be so cool to work for a paint company and get to do this kind of stuff all day long. I mean, I already kind of do, right? I get to play with paints. That's a pretty good job, too. All right, so this next one is Azurite Genuine. Uh, from what I remember, this is a really, really light color, and it's proving to be that. It's hard to get up very much pigment off of a little plate there. It's very light. Reminds me a lot of like a cerulean, almost like a little dirty cerulean color, and it would make a good sky. Not a perfectly bright sunny day, but like a grayish, like northern California coast day would be perfect for that. You see how light that color is. I know it can get darker, it's just difficult to do so. Got a little bit of that gel-like consistency coming out of it. I'm gonna leave it alone. Got Moon Glow. This is PR177, PG18, and PB29. So I know that's Ultramarine, Viridian, and some kind of maroon color. It's a really pretty dark purple. Although I believe it dries less saturated, which makes it a little bit less useful in my eyes, or uh, maybe less, not useful, but less, um, pretty attractive? I don't know. I like purple, so I like them to have saturation. You can already see it starting to granulate there, though. This is another color that I meant to double check my... Um, I don't want to do it right now because I'm going to make a mess, but I meant to double check my dot card because I do not recall seen a color called purple light on there. I feel like I would have remembered that. But I was surprised when Tiffany had it. It is a beautiful color. I feel like if I had known about this before getting the Rose of Ultramarine, I would have gotten this color instead. Or maybe I did know and I just didn't. I don't know. Totally eludes me at this moment, but it's a beautiful, soft, warm purple, and I feel like it would be more useful than the Rose of Ultramarine. The Rose of Ultramarine is so pretty, and it's vibrant, but again, I have no use for it in my everyday paintings, and I feel like I could find more uses for this one, especially if mixing it like with its complement with yellow. So I do want to practice more with this and see if it's something that I would use and see if it's something that I should consider picking up in the future. If you have this color, let me know. I have not heard literally anyone else ever talk about it. I've never seen a video with it. I've never seen a painting demonstration where they call it out. I just, I've never heard of it before. So I would be so curious to know. This next one was one that I saw when I very first started researching colors, but no other brand had it. And so I was like, well, I'm not sure what it is or how useful it is. It is similar to a Carmine or, um, a very, very deep purpley red. Uh, it's called Bordeaux, and when you tint it out, it gets even like pinker and bluer in tone. It is slightly opaque, so it's not as transparent as your other bright pinkishy magenta colors, but it's so pretty. And then Quinn Rose. Aha, I was not done with my 
my pans over here. Make sure I'm grabbing the right one. This is one Ophelia sent me. I've just got a little nub left of it. We all know PV19. Daniel Smith's is a cooler version, um, but clearly not as cool as the Bordeaux when we see them next to each other. But if you see this quinacridone rose next to other versions of quinacridone rose, this is really on the pink side rather than the red side. We're almost there. I didn't forget about serpentine. I promise I'll still show you. Poor serpentine. It's on a stick, so I don't always remember that I have it. I know a lot of people really love it. I don't find it as useful. Um, it's pretty on its own, but again, I don't do a lot of landscape paintings, so I don't often have a need for that color. The last one on this page is going to be Red Fuchsite Genuine. I'm trying to mix up some on the paper plate here. This is another sparkly color. Hope YouTube lets me upload this video. I don't think I have a tight uh, cap on how long my videos can be, but I've never had a video this long that I've tried to upload. Well, no, that's not true. I upload videos for Patreon all the time that are two hours, so it'll be fine. It'll just take a while. If you don't know about my Patreon, I've got a uh, real life lifetime, real time? What am I trying to say? I have real time tutorials on how to paint animals and other things like how to sketch and how to paint animal eyes. And uh, oftentimes those will be between an hour or two hours long, sometimes they're longer. I think one or two are a tiny bit shorter, but not by, lo by, not by a lot. See, I've lost my, my words. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, in the tutorials, I show you how to paint things in live time. So if you're interested in that, you can head on over and check that out. I'm going to put this off to the side just for a moment. And I'm looking for a little cheat sheet. Here we go. That's Canson XL. We'll be working with the same type of surface so you can see them in the same light. Here is Serpentine Genuine. It's going to take me a minute just to release some pigment here. I can show you why I don't like these sticks. I feel like they're all like this, at least the colors that I got. They're just hard to work up enough color to paint with. I know that's not true of all the colors. Like, I don't have any regular colors in the Primatex. I only have specialty colors or colors that I didn't already have. Um, I have Cobalt Teal. I've got Serpentine Genuine. I have Undersea Green. And then I've got um, New Gamboge. So I think that some of the other more typical colors will re -wet more easily. But the colors that I have, at least... Give me a hard time. And I feel like sometimes they get that gel-like consistency going on. I don't know what kind of binder they have or how much binder they have to form it into those sticks rather than having them in a tube form. So there we go. We can go ahead and hold this Serpentine Genuine next to, oh, I just stuck my finger in wet paint. Good job, Denise. We can go ahead and put this color next to our other greens. It is similar to sap green. I think that's probably why I don't use it very much because I would rather just use sap green and that's the same type of role it fills. The colors that I do have on my palette for greens are the sap green, the green appetite genuine, and the perylene green, which is over here. So that they're all fairly different from each other. Oh, and phthalo green, of course. So I just don't feel like I have an extra well to dedicate to this color, but it is definitely pretty. And it'll have like this light brown granulation that separates out of it. I don't know if you can see that. It hasn't really finished drying yet. But it has like this burnt sienna type of color that settles out of it versus the green appetite is much darker. All right, guys. I'm gonna take a sip of water. We'll go over our colors and then we'll wrap up this video.
Alright, so here are our yellows. The most transparent one that I have is the Lemon Yellow. Uh, again, that's not a color I see very often in other brands, but it's really, really beautiful. Very, very light, very, very cool. Um, I like Hansa Yellow Medium as a middle tone yellow. I think Nicolazzo Yellow is a really, really handy color when it comes to mixing, but I like the hue of Indian Yellow a little bit better with having that uh, 97 in it. It's a nice middle of the road color. I prefer PY65 to a new Gamboge, but this one is a little bit flatter in color, like it doesn't have the luminosity that the new Gamboge does. Usually I don't like flatness in my paints, but for whatever reason I do like this color quite a lot. Um, I've only got that one orange on this whole, whole palette and it's very close to red. You can see I don't have that many reds, relatively speaking, but my favorite one, I think, even seen it next to the Perlene Red, is the Pyro Red. Um, the Perlene is still nice, and I'll definitely use it in some more colors, uh, new, more paintings, so I can make a better informed decision about it. I don't know what to use Quinn Coral for, to be entirely honest. Um, I think it's something that floral painters would have a use for, but I don't know where to use it in animal paintings. Carmine is my favorite, and I can show it next to Quinacridone Rose over here. The Quinacridone Rose isn't quite done drying, but the Quin Rose is going to be more pink, whereas the Carmine is a little bit deeper in color, but I still like the Carmine better. We've got Quinacridone Magenta, Rose of Ultramarine. You can see that blue granulation settle out of it just a little bit. Um, Perlene Violet and Naphthamine Maroon are both very, very similar, with Perlene Violet being a little bit darker and a little bit more on the purple side, but both of them are fairly interchangeable with, the color, with each other, depending on which color you want more prominent. We've got our Carbazole Violet, and I believe that this specifies that it's the red shade, but honestly, that looks pretty blue to me, so I don't know, six or one half dozen of the other. Here's that shadow violet that's really, in my opinion, a gray. You can see that there is some pretty heavy granulation in there. There's a blue that settles out and a pink that kind of comes forward, and maybe that's where they're getting violet from, but I would rather have that color called some form of gray. We've got the amethyst here that... Can you see it? Can you see it sparkle? It's so pretty. All right. Then we've got uh, a little row of blues here, so we've got French Ultramarine, we've got the Thalo Blue Red Shade, which is my favorite shade of, of blue. I don't I haven't used it in mixing, and from what I've heard, it's not as useful as the green shade is, but it's so, so pretty. I just love that color. We've got Thalo Turquoise, which I think is a really nice tone. Um, we've got the Ultramarine Turquoise down here to compare. This one granulates. This one doesn't. We've got the Mayan Blue Genuine, which is a bit streaky for my tastes. The Mayan Dark Blue is really, really stunning. Um, I don't have Prussian Blue from Daniel Smith, but it's similar in tone, but a little bit more on the moody side. You can see here Indian Throne is fine, like it's a nice blue denim color, but it isn't as deep as the M. Graham's version. We've got three colors that I think are pretty darn similar, and I apologize, the light just like disappeared outside. There must be clouds that rolled in over the sun. Let me see if I can... Do you need to be bumped up? I think you probably have a lower exposure here. Try that out. All right, <laughs> anyway, these three colors are very, very similar. Payne's Gray has the most texture because there's an ultramarine in it. These two are literally the same two pigments. I don't know why there's two of them. This one is slightly more blue. This one is slightly more gray, but I don't think they needed to make a whole second color. Um, we've got Perlene Green here, which is a dark color, but it's uh, definitely on the green family. Got a beautiful deep sap green. Oh my gosh, you guys, this, I don't know where the sun went. I'm gonna open the window real quick. It's like I'm living in a cave. I don't think that helped really at all, but I did the best I could. Those lights, I promise, they're coming soon. All right, we've got our Thalo Green, which is invaluable for mixing, at least in my opinion. We've got Amazite, Amazonite Genuine, which is somewhere between a Cobalt Teal and a, and a Thalo Green, so it's somewhere in the middle there. 
cobalt teal. Again, I don't love this version, or at least not from the stick form. Um, I don't know if the tube would be any different. And we've got Fuchsite Genuine. It's another sparkly color, although I have no idea whether or not you can see that on camera. So pretty. Sea foamy green with sparkles. All right, moving on to our second page here. We've got our cobalt turquoise, which is a very moody, dusky gray shade of turquoise, our Sleeping Beauty turquoise genuine, which granulates super, super heavily. Maybe when I said that the transparent oxide or transparent brown oxide granulates the most, it, this one could give it a run for its money. It's a different granulation pattern, but this one definitely granulates very heavily. We've got our jadeite green, which is a bluish green that has a brown granulation in it. Cascade green, camera focus. Cascade Green, which is that phthalo blue mixed with our raw sienna type of color. Undersea Green. I still don't see undersea, guys. I just see like a foresty green. But what do I know? We've got Green Appetite Genuine, which has that neon green with the brown granulation that settles out of it. Our two sap greens, with the first one being a little bit more luminous and a little bit more on the yellow side with the second one being a very close contender that I just need to get over and just accept into my life. It's fine, it's beautiful, it'll work. We've got green gold, rich green gold, which is what other people call green gold, although I think this version is more yellow. I think that other people's green golds are a little bit leaning more to the green side. Buff titanium, which again, I don't have a lot of uses for, but I am gonna try out that cobalt teal-ish looking mixture with the buff titanium and the phthalo green. We've got Naples Yellow, which has that chalky white color. I'm glad I only bought a 5 milliliter tube of this, because I'm not going to use it very often. We've got our PY43, our PBR7s that are all fairly close in texture, with this one being the most yellow than this one, and then this is the most brown. We've got a very, very, very vibrant shade of golden orange with the Aussie Red Gold, Quinacridone Gold, nothing else needed to be said. We've got a version of Quinacridone Gold Deep, which has our Quinacridone Burnt Orange in it. Then we have a wide range of red, reddish brown earth tones. So we've got, starting with the most red, is that Quinacridone Burnt Scarlet. Moving into the Garnet Genuine, Red Iron Oxide, the environmentally friendly version. You can see it granulates. We've got the Burnt Sienna, Permanent Brown, Transparent Brown Oxide. We've got a nice middle of the road burnt umber, our raw umber violet, which I like better if you just mix it yourself with those two colors. Neutral tint, because I forgot to put it with the other indigos. If we can run these together, maybe. Nope. Can't get them all on screen, there we go. It's very close to the other ones too, so take a pick. You don't need all of them. We've got our lunar blue, which is a blue and a black that separate out with each other. Blue Appetite Genuine, which is a granulating blue Primatech color. They've got a lot of those. Here's another one with the Azurite Genuine. We've got Moon Glow, which is a muted purple color. We've got Purpleite, which is a granulating warm purple. Bordeaux, Quinacridone Rose, and Red Fuchsite Genuine. You guys, we did it. It only took two hours, but we did it. So uh, I hope that you enjoyed these look this look at all of these Daniel Smith watercolors. I will post those images so that you can see them more clearly over on my Patreon. If you'd like to take a look at them, they will be for free. You don't have to pay anything for them. And uh, thank you guys I for watching today. Make sure to tune in for our next video on Thursday for the Animal Artist Collective, where we are going to have fun with the theme of tropical rainforests. If you'd like to more find out more information about the Animal Artist Collective, visit us on Facebook or Instagram at Animal Artist collective or on twitter at animal artist co thank you guys for watching i'll see you next time